What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Things You Don't Hear in Church podcast. My name is Ethan. My name is Derry. And guys, you can find us on Instagram and YouTube. We've been posting quite a bit more on Instagram, which isn't saying much compared to what we were doing before. But hey, we're there. We're talking to people. We're making fun content. And of course, on YouTube, we got the weekly podcast as well as a couple of videos throughout the week as well. So go ahead and follow us there. And if you could, if you would like to help us be able to afford some subscription services that will help us make better content, um, other like different applications and things in the production process of this podcast, go ahead and support us on Patreon. That would be super fun and really helpful and really loving. So consider that um, if you find value in this podcast. Um, And with that, we'll get into the show. Today, we're going to be talking about something that I think is really important to the Christian faith. And that is if the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are talked about in the New Testament are still for today or not. So the theological terms for these things are cessationism, for those who think that the gifts have ceased, and continuationism, for those who think that the gifts are still continuing today. I think that, uh, first, just to to give you kind of a, a playing field of who believes these things, within most of evangelicalism, um, most people, I think, are continuationist by word only. I think some of the more extreme, like charismatics, actually practice the gifts, actually pray for healing, speak in tongues, all that kind of stuff. Uh, whether you believe it or not is kind of against the point right now. These are just the people who say they practice these things, right? So those charismatics are uh, certain denominations will practice it. Most non-denoms, in my experience, maybe it's different for you, Ethan, but in my experience... A ton of non-denoms will say, yeah, we believe the gifts have continued, but they don't necessarily teach how to use those gifts, don't really encourage it necessarily, and just like say they believe it, and maybe God heals someone once every 10 years or something when he wants to, but no one really pursues those things or prays for those things. They just kind of leave it up to the individual in the congregation to pursue if they want to. And that's just kind of their prerogative whether that's for like a, a safety kind of thing, is they don't want to get too charismatic or something, or if it's just because they don't value them very highly. I'm not sure why that is. And then you have another sort of sect of part of the more like conservative branches of Christianity, uh, certain Baptist churches, um, certain Presbyterian churches, depending on the one that you go to, other denominations that are usually Reformed and also cessationist. And so they would believe that the gift has ended that they were for a certain time, and they're not for uh, today anymore. So maybe you've heard of these things before. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've wondered, as you've read through the New Testament, and you're like, wow, like Jesus is commanding his disciples all the time to go do these things, and he's, he's gifting them to like raise the dead, and it seems like I'm being commanded to do the same thing, but like that's pretty crazy. I don't think I could raise the dead. Like That's, that's just kind of wild. I don't think that's really for me for today. Uh, maybe you've had those thoughts before. I know I've definitely read those portions of Scripture and been like, I don't know if that's really like what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, raising the dead, am I capable of something like that? Um, and then maybe you've read portions of Scripture where you're like, whoa, Jesus says that the same power that lives in me through the Holy Spirit is the same power that raised him from the dead. Like, that's pretty serious. Like, if that's true, like, I need to be experiencing and using that power in my everyday life. That seems like a pretty integral part of what it means to be a Christian, if that's true. So that's what we want to get into today. Uh, before I get into the case for stationism, try to like steel man it, give a good argument for it. Is there anything you want to say, Ethan? Uh, yeah, just this belief started around the Reformation, I think. I think specifically with Calvin is some of the earliest, maybe a little bit before, but before the Protestant Reformation, this the claim is that it was a historically held view that like oh miracles stop, but it's actually not true. So we're gonna get into that, but uh, just some context there. And it seems, just from my opinion, distinctly American. Now maybe that's just because I lack a lot of input from other nations and their mm-hmm. Christian resources, and I'm American. But I've never met a cessationist outside of America. So you'd probably be laughed at. I don't have if you are a cessationist outside of America. You're just like around any African congregation ever in America in Hmm. in Africa, and they're like, "What? We're seeing demons cast out on the daily." You're in India, and like the demons are throwing people on the ground and being delivered, and they're like, "Wait, you don't 
it's happening. What do you mean? Anyways, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're kind of letting the cart before the horse there. <laughs> um, so if you never if you never listened to an episode before, you don't know what you think. <laughs> yeah. Now if you, you thought we were cessationists, I don't know where you've been or what who you've been. Yeah. You haven't been listening to this podcast. Uh, so, Derry, let's try to make a case. We want to be gracious, right? We, we don't want to misrepresent mm. cessationists. We think they're brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a theological disagreement. It's not a salvation mm-hmm. issue. It might be something that I, I specifically sometimes feel like cessationists can be mean or I, th- I think the, the view can cause some problems. But, you know, they're Christians and we're going to be in the kingdom with them forever. So we're not trying to attack or straw man and belittle any cessationists here. If you're a cessationist, you're welcome on the show anytime to talk about it. Uh, we just want to see if what we, how we read the Bible, if this is what the Bible teaches. And if there can be a case made that the Bible does say cessationism is true, then I will become a cessationist because I want to align with truth, not just my opinions. That's good. My challenge to anybody who's listening to this right now that's going to be uh, listening to the whole episode, I hope that you would be challenged by what we're going to talk about on both sides to look into these cases. And no matter what you think is true, if you think cessationism is true, if you think continuationism is true, to commit yourself to that belief. Um, Because like I said before, too many people just say, okay, I think I believe this, and then just continue to live as if gifts don't exist, even if they think they do exist. And so, honestly, if you come to the end of this podcast and you're like, the gifts don't exist, great. Operate in that. But if you come to the end of this podcast and you think, wow, I think that the gifts are for today and for me, and the Holy Spirit is still working and speaking, then that should radically change how you interact with God, uh, how you hear His voice, and how you live your life, right? That should change your everyday life, um, especially how you're going to do evangelism, how you're talking to people, the things that you believe that God could do through you. Um, that's going to do something to your faith. So just a challenge at the beginning, like if that's the thing you come away with at the end, you need to let it actually impact your life and ask the Lord. Maybe you're scared, right? Like this is pretty crazy stuff. Ask the Lord, like, hey, how are you asking me to step out? How are you asking me to challenge myself and my faith? Uh, through these things and see what he does because he will challenge you he will give you opportunities they will be uncomfortable but it's going to be pretty cool to see what the lord does in our opinion so with all that said let's get into the the evidence for cessationism the case that most of them will make when they're talking about it honestly it's a very simple case it's multifaceted but uh, it's pretty simple at the same time right their worldview would say okay these gifts given the ones that you see throughout the new testament We'll make a, a biblical case for it later. All right, I was just giving an overview. These verses in the New Testament we see where it's talked about the gifts that are given to the apostles and then to the churches and what it looks like to be in a church and churches are speaking in tongues and all this stuff is happening, right? This is the apostolic age. The canon of scripture is being created. The, the letters are being written to certain churches that will be penned down and will be given to us eventually that will be you know, codified as the actual uh, scriptures that God wants all Christians to have uh, for all time after this point. So the, this is the apostolic age. These things are happening. And so the gospel is currently being oppressed in the place that it's in in the first century um, in Jerusalem, you know, Roman occupation. Uh, it's not very popular to be Christian. Uh, you're being killed, you're being persecuted, you're being driven out. You know, it's the whole Paul story, right? He's he's going out and killing people uh, until he has his conversion. So the gifts of the Spirit in this view during this apostolic time is for the spreading of the gospel. So people see the power of the gospel and they're convinced by it and they come to believe in it so that people can be saved and the gospel can spread sort of like a you know, some people who aren't very good at starting fires uh, in the wilderness when you're camping, you just bring some gasoline, right? And like, you don't need the gasoline the whole time. You just need it at the beginning. You spray some gasoline on your little tinder you got down there, you throw a match on it, and boom, it blows up, fire starts very quickly. And then from there on, you're not continually dumping gasoline on it. You're just going to, you know, keep getting sticks here and there. They're going to slow burn instead of quick burn, right? That's kind of the cessationist thought here. That the, the starting of Christianity after Christ died on the cross, it needed this gasoline, which are the the gifts of the Spirit, 
to kind of jumpstart the movement, get a lot of people involved, interested, and spread the gospel to many different areas because they knew it was going to be persecuted, because God knew it was going to be persecuted, right, and try to be stomped out. So this is sort of the fuel for the beginning of the fire when it comes to the spreading of the gospel in this first century context. So one of the main verses that a lot of cessationists will pull from uh, when I think the main verse, actually, when we're talking about cessationism is they'll read from First Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. I'll just read it really fast. And it says, love never fails. And obviously, this is out of context. I'm sure Ethan will go through the context later. But right now, this is what it says. Love never fails. But there are prophecies. They will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part... And we prophesy in part, but when the completeness comes, what is in part will disappear. And so in this verse in Corinthians, a lot of cessationists, or all cessationists, I would imagine, would say, okay, look, here we see these gifts are all ceasing. And so this is talking about this completeness that it's saying, and that like once this completeness comes, all these different things will disappear. These things are going to disappear Uh, When this completeness comes, and that completeness is the completeness of the canon of Scripture. So as soon as the canon is codified, as soon as they know exactly what Christ, what uh, God was trying to say to us in this earth, through the letters, through the Gospels, through the revelation given to John, once we have all those things, um, we're good to go. We don't need this stuff anymore. Now the Bible is what we're going to spread around the world to convince people that Jesus is God, that they should follow him. Right. So that's the the kind of beginning argument there when it comes to cessationism. Um, after that, a lot of um, cessationists would say, well, the one of the main arguments that we have beyond just this verse right here is that um, there seems to be a slowing down of the gifts after this like apostolic age. After the first couple hundred years of Christianity, we see like the gifts not talked about a ton anymore. Um, and so from a church history perspective, we would say that they've ended. We have a couple different people, one including um, Augustine, talking and saying, hey, I'm not sure if the gifts kind of continue anymore. And, you know, I, if you know Augustine, uh, he's a really famous early church father, um, was responsible in part for, like, the popularization of Christianity in the Roman world. A uh, really influential guy, shaped a lot of the theology that we have today. Um and so in his early life, he's saying, yeah, I'm not sure if these gifts are legit. I'm not sure if like they continued. Maybe there's this age, all that kind of stuff. So those are some of the main arguments. The closing of the canon is really important for them. The slowing down of the spiritual gifts. Um, that one verse from Corinthians. But beyond that, there aren't a ton of other verses that they pull from. Um, I'll read one more verse really fast from Hebrews. Um, which is the last verse that I think most cessationists will pull from when they're making the argument, and it's Hebrews 2, 3 through 4. Um, and this verse kind of suggests that the signs and wonders, that like those are just to confirm the message of Christ, right? So really fast, the last thing. It says, This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testifies to it by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So just to to certify their point a little more, they would say, okay, look, these things are given to certify the gospel. Once this age ended, those things also ended. They're no longer needed because the gospel is certified. People believe in him. It's spread. Now we have scripture. So I think that's uh, all that I want to say for that case so far. All the other stuff people will say is, I think, just kind of fluff and kind of just adds to those things. But, Ethan, anything you want to add on that that case real fast? What was that last Hebrews verse? Uh, Yeah, sorry, let me pull it back up real quick. Um, Hebrews 2, 3 through 4. Hebrews 2, 3 and 4. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Yeah. And then... They also go to Hebrews 1, actually, too, which is um, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So they'll point to this and say, see, God's not using prophets anymore. He's using Jesus. Prophecy isn't happening. Um, and there's some things we can discuss there. Um, but that's another verse they use. Is now the time we want to 
respond with the Bible verses that kind of contradict their points that they're making? Uh, sure. Yeah. Let's go into it. Okay. So on our side, we're going to make uh, a few different arguments. We're going to go through on our portion what we believe because we're continuationists. We're going to talk about what the Bible says. We want to talk about what history says in response. And then we're going to talk about our own personal experiences. And so those are the kind of three categories we want to go through mm-hmm. to give evidence for our position. Yeah. So in response to 1 Corinthians 13, 10, what, you know, the one that says when that which is perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Th- that which is perfect, I, I'm pretty sure in context is the second coming of Jesus Christ. The only thing it says in, in this chapter is like love is patient, love is kind. And the whole idea is that if I don't have love, I'm nothing. So the whole chapter is like if I don't have love, I'm nothing. And the first couple of verses bef- or chapters before that are about spiritual gifts. But if you think about, well, what's perfect? What is that which is perfect? Well, that which is perfect, you can't say it's like, oh, that's when the Holy Spirit comes because Pentecost is when all these things started. So it can't be that. And so what is it? Is it the Bible? Is it the canonization of the Bible? Probably not because I don't know. I mean, what does it mean by if you're going to say the Bible is perfect, what does that mean? Like, yes, it reveals the teachings of God. and then there's But there's a lot of people who say there's a lot of, uh, contradictions or there's questionable things that seem like, oh, you know, this verse calls, says Satan enticed David and this verse says Yahweh. Is that a, is that a contradiction? And we've talked about in the podcast. It's, it's not a contradiction. Mm-hmm. But so there's questions of is the Bible that which is perfect? And at w- which is how is it this 66 book canon? Because before that, it w- there was other books that were considered canon. So which Bible, you know? Is it the Ethiopian Bible that has more? Is it the is it the Catholic with the Apocrypha? You know, how, how do we know what that which is perfect is? And so I think it's fair to say that which is perfect is Jesus. And so when Jesus comes again and establishes his kingdom and all the sinners are, are judged and, and, you know, we live in eternity with God forever, that's when the gifts will cease. You won't need to prophesy because you'll be living with God. You won't have to do healing because no one will be injured, you know? So that's why mm. these things will stop. But right now we... Can I uh, give a couple more references there? Yeah, too? yeah, go for it. Uh, just a couple evidences as well from that same verse Ethan was quoting, just to solidify Ethan's point. I think this is really crucial when we're thinking about what is the thing that is perfect that is coming. <clears throat> if you think about the things that will end, that should have ended during the apostolic era, if... The Bible is the thing that's perfect that is going to come. These are two things that I don't think make sense within the context of this verse. Uh, The first is that, okay, it says uh, they will be, the tongues will be stilled in verse eight. And then it says before verse nine, right here, where there is knowledge, it will pass away. In my mind, I still have knowledge. Like that hasn't passed away for me. And so I don't know did they have some kind of special knowledge that was before the canonization of scripture or something? Or what is that a reference to? That seems to be confusing to me. Everyone was super smart. I guess. Yeah. And we just have some kind of lesser knowledge now. Like I would love to hear a cessationist explain to me like what knowledge was. Maybe they mean like get the gift of knowledge, like, like gifts of like getting a word for somebody that they didn't know. But I don't think that's what that is in context. The only problem with that. Yeah. The only problem with the foreknowledge thing is Paul talks about foreknowledge and he yeah. calls it foreknowledge. So if he meant to say foreknowledge will cease, he would have said it because he's already yeah. said it. And then also, I don't know if maybe they would think that scripture is being personified here or something. But if you read down in verse 12, it says, for now we see only uh, as a reflection, as through a mirror. Um, but then we shall see face to face. We know now only in part but then we shall be fully known. And so this seems like a very personal thing. Like Ethan was saying, this doesn't seem like an inanimate thing, like uh, a book that we're gonna be getting, but it seems like at a person that's going to be coming again. Right now, they don't see Christ. They only have the spirit which testifies of him, but soon he's gonna come again and you're gonna see him face to face. You only know him in part through the testimonies right now, but soon you're going to know him or be fully known by him because you're gonna be with him. And so it, I think it makes a lot more sense in context. This is about uh, a future coming of Christ rather than being about some, uh, you know, the book, the Bible coming. Mm-hmm. And if you keep reading, you're fine. If you keep reading into the next 
chapter, Paul literally says, this is 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Pursue love, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So we have a situation here where one verse, apparently they're saying, this is why it stops, but the next verse he says, do it that you may prophesy. And one thing I think cessationists will say is that only the, only the apostles could do these things. But if only the apostles could do this, then why is Paul instructing an entire church to do it and giving instruction on how mm. it should be done? So that's one question. And then if you keep reading towards the end of the chapter in verses 39, it says, So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. That's where charismatics could use some correction. Decently and in order. Mm. But we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because it looks weird. We're not just going to say this thing's not for today. Um, and uh, moving on to different verses or different Bible uh, passages outside of Corinthians, we have in First Thessalonians 5, verses 20 and 21, it says, uh, Do not despise prophecies, but, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So we're not supposed to despise prophecy, but we're supposed to test them. So again, an instruction to the church. And then I think the biggest one, not one of the, not the biggest, but one of the biggest verses to support continuationists is in Mark 16, verses 17. And people will immediately say, well, we don't know if that last part of chapter 16 was in the original uh, manuscripts, or we don't know if we want to accept it. I kind of feel like yeah, we. I think there's enough reasons to believe it was original and it's still here today, so it probably means something. Uh, and so it says, and these signs, this is Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. And that, and he says, these will accompany those who believe in my name, not those who believe in my name for a time, not those who believe in me that is just a 12, actually, not everybody. It's not limited. It just says those who believe will do these things. And so there's, I think there's a lot more robust scriptural reasons that you can just take at face value that lend themselves to, to support that continuationism is the right view. Mm. Now, I do think we, because there's not a lot of focus on this, like you were saying, Derry, earlier, that a lot of people say, oh yeah, we believe it, but we don't teach it, or we believe it, or, or they won't spend time on it, or they won't have times of practicing it. Um, I think that is the reason we have a strong response from people who are cessationists, because they see how out of hand it gets. I've been in a number of mm. services where it got out of hand and I'm like, okay, we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, I just, so I saw someone um, doing some tongues in public and they were, they were publicly praying in tongues without an interpreter. So I, I, I talked to them privately and I was like, Hey, I just want to talk to you about this. You know, this is what you're doing. This is what the Bible says. The only time you should be doing tongues or speaking tongues without an interpreter is privately with yourself and with the Lord. That's the, in first mm. Corinthians 14. Otherwise, you need an interpreter, right? And so it has to be done orderly. It has to be done decently. And it, and we need to learn how to do that better. But we don't reject the gifts because we think it's weird. That's great. One more thing I'll add uh, to the biblical argument here is that if the gifts were going to end when the persecution of the church ended, right? Because that's the end of the apostolic age. When, you know, Rome officially creates, and maybe you say it's longer than this, but I think that this is kind of the ending point. When Rome kind of creates Christianity as the majority religion of the state, so basically of the world, makes Christianity the religion of the world, it, for the most part, ends the persecution of Christians, or at least popularizes Christianity, right? And so now you have the end of all of this kind of persecution or the larger end of it. And so you would no longer need these gifts if that's the case. If Paul is going to be teaching a church that you should do all these gifts. You should pray for them. You should desire them. I do them. 
so you should desire to do them just like I do them, right? If he's teaching churches how to do this, because it's the fire starter that's going to be able to uh, get them through this persecution, I would imagine he would probably let them know at least once in one of his letters that someone in the New Testament will let somebody know at some point, hey, look, this persecution is going to cease at some point and you're not going to need these gifts anymore. Like have hope, like have hope that you're not going to need these at some mm. point because persecution is going to end and you're going to have like more freedom and you're going to like live freer or whatever. Like they have this greater hope that uh, this isn't going to last very long or at least uh, not for like the rest of time. Right. It seems like at least one time there'd be some kind of hint that, Hey, there's this uh, final end of scripture is coming uh, there's this age that's going to come to the end. There's this persecution that's going to be finished. There's going to be some kind of stabilization, codification of our beliefs. And we're not going to need the spirit anymore. We're not going to need these continuing gifts because we're going to have an amount of peace. It seems like there would be something in Scripture somewhere that would make a reference to that. And there's literally nothing. Like there's not one time where mm-hmm. you can see Paul, Peter, anybody that's speaking in the New Testament, John, say, hey, the gifts are going to end or there's going to be the end of this era, the apostolic era. It's purely an invention looking back at the text and saying, this is what I think is happening, not what the text is actually saying, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. And for the Hebrews thing, right, where it says he's spoken to us through Jesus, his son, it's Jesus is still communicating. It's like Jesus prompting, hey, go heal that person. Hey, mm-hmm. go... So all the supernatural stuff flows from God, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility to say that, yes, the prophecies that are happening, although they're different than Old Testament prophecy, in a way, are they're still coming from Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, just a little bit on prophecy. In Prophecy always is just pointing back to the covenant all the major prophets that are like all this doom and gloom and this is going to happen. It sounds like they're predicting the future. They're actually just calling back to the covenant Mm. in which they agreed to. So if you read Deuteronomy, God says, if you disobey me and don't follow me, this is what's going to happen. So all the prophets are saying doom and gloom and all this stuff's going to happen. And then it does. It's because they're saying, Hey, remember you agreed to this. I'm just reading the original agreement. This is what's going to happen. And they didn't repent. So nowadays prophecy today and I think it's in Corinthians somewhere. Um, it says that the testimony of Jesus is prophecy. Or it says the testimony of Jesus is wisdom, but the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, something like that. You can look it up. But anytime you're preaching the gospel, that's a form of prophecy, possibly. It's how I read it. You know, I could be wrong. Oh, that's no, how, that's what's what that? is pro- prophecy in the Old Testament. That's what prophecy is in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. It's just relaying what God has said. Yeah. If yeah. You're relaying what Jesus has said through scripture. That's prophecy. You're prophesying. Yeah, and so if you're yeah. calling people to repent, that's prophecy. If you're saying, like, hey, like God's going to take care of you. He's going to provide for you. Don't worry. That's prophecy because we have that in Scripture. Now, it might not look like, you know, health and wealth, like, has has been presented, and that's what's wrong, mm-hmm. right? When people misconstrue what God's promises mean and they promise something that God didn't promise, that's wrong. But prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. and it's And why is that? Because Jesus is the new covenant, so we're still doing the same thing. We're calling back to our covenant. We're just not under the old covenant. So the covenant we call back to is Jesus Christ and the gospel and the faith. Mm. And so that is, that, that's fine. You can prophesy. Now, also people think it means like words of knowledge and all these weird things. And you're going to, someone said to me, like, I got to prophesy over you. And they had this big thing they, they said over me. And, you know, if it comes true, dope. I, I will, I, I kind of will, I will humbly take it, I guess. It's a pretty big word they said. So it kind of seems like, it would bear a lot of responsibility. But if that's how the Lord wants to use my life, then that's up to him. Uh, and we'll see if that prophecy was right. But at the very least, you can preach the gospel to people, and that's prophecy. You can encourage your brothers and sisters in the faith when they're down, and that's prophecy. So when people say, like, just prophesy over one another right now, it's like, okay, just remind each other of the truth. Hmm. It's pretty simple. It's a fancy word. makes people uncomfortable, but it's pretty simple. Hmm. That's great. Okay, so that's the beginning of our argument for continuationism. Uh, If you remember back to when I talked about cessationism and their main tenets, uh, the main things they talk about is an age, this Corinthians verse, this Hebrews verse, and uh, then after this age ends, that the church kind of starts teaching that the gifts have ceased. So we wanted to talk about the continuationist view of the early church. Um, And I think 
if you just read early church fathers, you can pick anyone you want. You're going to see that they believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I don't care which early church father you believe in. You have to severely cherry pick your way through the early church fathers, just looking for individual places where it seems to say that, hey, maybe these gifts have slowed down or maybe they've ceased. And But it's really contextual in a lot of those places. And you can find a hundred other places where that exact same church father has said, oh, actually, they still continue. Like that was just like one time back there, I changed my mind. They've still continue. Or that was for a specific place. They still generally continue. Or they just slow down a little bit. Now they're continuing uh, globally though. And it's very few early church fathers that will mention anything like that. So let me just read you a couple of different quotes from early church fathers. Um, you can go look these up yourself, read these for yourself, see what the early church fathers had to say. I'll go from, you know, first century all the way through until like medieval times to where it doesn't really matter as much anymore. And then explain uh, the reformation, all that kind of stuff. Well, we know that like, like even said at the beginning, uh, after the middle ages, you have the reformation. Uh, and that's where, you know, cessationism really got started and kind of kicking I have a little more popularity. Which is weird, because didn't they have like the bubonic plague? It's like, that's when you guys need miracles. <laughs> yeah. Why would you try to teach they don't exist when you're all dying? Yeah. Rip. All right, so <laughs> you guys have maybe heard of some of these people before. I'll, na- I'll try to name a few different people and quote from a few different people uh, from each age, but here we go. So the first one we have is Arrhenius, and Arrhenius lived from 130 to 202 AD. And in his work Against Heresies, he talks about how gifts uh, continue, how prophecy continues, how speaking in tongues continue. And so this is the first century. So some people might still argue this is in the acceptable window, right, of the age. But he says, uh, For some do certainly and truly uh, drive out devils, so that those who have been cleansed from evil spirits frequently believe in Christ and join the church. And others have foreknowledge of things to come. They see visions and utter prophecies, um, or prophetic expressions. And others still heal the sick by laying on of hands upon them, and they are made whole. So this is a chapter 2, 32, 4 from Against Heresies. You can go read that. Next one I have is Tertullian, who is lived in five, uh, 155 to 240 AD. Um, and Tertullian also affirms the same thing. Um, he's got some pretty long writings on it, but he also believes that the gifts continue, that there is not an apostolic age that kind of ends them. Uh, he thinks that the, the the gifts still continue on. I won't read all their long like quotations just because it would take us forever. Um, but Origen is another one. He lives from 185 to 254 AD, and he acknowledges the same thing. He doesn't think that there's some age that's going to end the spiritual gifts. Um, he, he does come from a little bit of a Gnostic background, so he does... He is kind of wary. He's converted to Christianity. So he is kind of wary of the gifts because it's not very normal to him. But he agrees that they still happen, um, although he is a little skeptical about them. He admits that, yeah, like these things are going on in Christian circles and like they should be happening, right? These gifts sh- 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 are still happening and should still happen. He affirms them. So those are the uh, the first three that I wanted to read from. Um, you have a ton of different controversies that come up. These I just wanted to talk about really quick because a lot of uh, cessationists will sort of bring up a couple of these to say, hey, look, this is a point where you see the church formally say, hey, look, these gifts have ceased. Like, these are bad. Stop doing them. Especially around uh, Arrhenius, Origen, those times. So uh, the first one is called uh, the Montanist controversy sort of off topic of of church history but an event that happened in church history but not like a a church father or a quote um this is something that a lot of cessationists will bring it bring up this controversy and it's the montanist controversy and they'll say that look there's this incident where the church fathers condemn the use of gifts in this uh certain church and so that means that uh they don't think they continue right i think that is a gross mischaracterization of what's happening here the montanist movement are a group of people that are getting uh, prophecies, revelation from the Lord, and they're saying that it's on par with Scripture, right? Which is not the biblical teaching, is not uh, what anybody in this time period would have said, and is exactly what the church fathers say when they write about the Montanist controversy. They say, hey, these people aren't using the gifts as described in Scripture. They're saying that they're the ones that are like doing the healing, like they don't have the power of God, they don't need the power of God, like they're the ones that are wielding this power, and that uh, their teachings, their prophecy, their revelation 
is on par with scripture, right? And that was, should, and obviously is rejected by the church. Like that's not what we believe the gifts are for. That's not what the church believe the gifts are for now and then, right? So I think it's a misrepresentation to say, well, the church is rejecting these people because they're rejecting that the gifts continued. That is not what's happening. The gifts are being misused here and they're, even their writings, they're saying, hey, look, the gifts are being used other places. This is not how you should use them. It's it's pretty clear if you're not trying to read your own context into it, that that's what's happening here. So that happens uh, amid the first century as well, first, second century, and uh, yeah, the second century, sorry. Uh, and so that is happening among the lives of these early church fathers that I read before, uh, Ignatius, Tertullian, and Origen. They would have been speaking into this, and their view about the gifts continuing would have been at applicable to this controversy. Okay, so I want to skip now to uh, some maybe more relevant to after the apostolic age, some church fathers that spoke. Um, one thing I want to mention too that is a little bit interesting is you would think that uh, after the apostolic age, the church is sort of one, right? The Catholics have become a thing uh, and you have like a more unified church that is establishing doctrines and order and all that kind of stuff. It's no longer just house churches that are being persecuted. The The church has power politically uh, and religiously now, right? So um, this is as this sort of apostolic age comes to an end from a, a cessationist standpoint and the church has been codified. You have the Bible. You would think that as the church begins to have councils, the Council of Nicaea, and on and on, right? That at some point they would mention during one of these councils, because at the council, at a lot of these councils, you uh, have major doctrine being talked about, right? They meet as a group of churches to say, hey, this is what Christians believe. This is what the Bible says. And this is what we're saying we believe as Christians. We're getting rid of these heresies that people believe. You would think that at some point in one of these councils, they would have come together and, and said, hey, there's all these church fathers that are saying that the gifts are continuing. We're going to come together as a church and say, hey, that's a heresy. We don't believe they continue. Cut it out. That never happens. Not one time in any of the councils that happen. And there's a lot of councils that happen and still happen today if you're a Catholic, right? There's a lot of councils that happen. And not a one time do they address gifts ending. In my opinion, pretty strong evidence that they thought that they continued, Right. As well as if you're a Catholic or an Orthodox person today of most traditions, you believe the gifts continue. And now your gifts are a little weird at sometimes, right? And not everybody gets to have uh, a toast that has Jesus's face burned into it. Like not everybody gets that. And that's a joke. But you see those pictures on the Internet. But you have stuff like <laughs> the Shroud of Turin and all these different uh, sort of miraculous things that are showing up. If you want to read about like Catholic miracles, or Orthodox miracles, they get wacky, but they're pretty cool. A lot of the times, uh, they're very interesting. Mm -hmm. You could isn't there a statue of Mary that's perpetually crying? Something like that. Yeah, there's a you know a lot of their gifts have yeah. to do with oil continually coming out of stuff or certain uh, articles of things healing people all the time. But they they do have just general gifts too of priests and different people healing people, casting out demons, uh, laying on hands, all that kind of stuff, raising people from the dead. You have mm -hmm. that all over church history as well. So it would be very interesting. If maybe a cessationist would say, well, that's the Catholic Church. They are demonic or they're not the real church. And so it makes sense that they believe the gifts continue. My question to them would be, well, so the only Christians that exist throughout church history for like 1500 years is just the Catholic and Orthodox Church. And they're doing that. So you're saying that like the gifts cease with the apostles and so did the church. And that it doesn't reemerge until cessationists emerge with the Reformation. Like that's a pretty bold take. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that would be what most cessationists would say. And so it's just a little confusing to me. Yeah. I mean, there are some cessationists who say, like, namely John MacArthur, who says that to be a continuationist is to believe a false gospel, mm -hmm. which is crazy. So he's like, is it salvific? I don't know. It's dangerous. It's a false gospel. I'm like, that sounds pretty salvific for me or to me. You know, Paul says if anyone comes and preaches a different gospel, let them be accursed. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to say that to be a continuationist is you're believing a false gospel, you're saying we're accursed, which is condemned to hell. Mm. Yeah, pretty crazy. Pretty bold statements. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Uh, really fast, going on to the Middle Ages, we have people like Hildegard, uh, Francis of Assisi, 
different people like that that wrote extensively about visions they had, about how they think that uh, prophecy still happens, speaking in tongues still happens, healing people still happens. You have all these church fathers throughout history. Let's go to uh, Thomas Aquinas, one of the most famous church fathers of all time. He, and if, especially if you like doctrine, right? You like theological thought. Aquinas is like the the richest, one of the most rich people you can read on this because he knew so much, wrote so much, has like the beginning of, or at least the beginnings of our like systematic theologies that we have today. He did a lot of work within philosophy and the foundations of Christian philosophy. So he's done a lot of stuff. Um, even he, a very intellectual person, affirmed over and over that the gifts still continue, that they happen today, that he sees Christians using them, um, and he thinks that they're beautiful. You can read um, in even Aquinas's, let me try to say this correctly, Summa uh, Theologica. If you read that, it's like one of his... Yep, that's, uh, there you go. One of his books about theology, one of his main ones, a uh, pretty big book that he writes about theology. He states in it that he thinks the gifts still continue and they happen today. So... I don't quote all these things for you just because we would be here forever. I have like a hundred different quotations in front of me. There's tons and tons of people throughout all of church history. I would say 98% of church fathers that write on this topic throughout the last uh, 1500 years of church history all agree, hey, the gifts are happening today. They have still continued. Maybe some of them will say that they've slowed down a little bit, but they still think that they're continuing. They still see people in churches doing them. They still see the Holy Spirit filling people and speaking. I think it's it's really, really hard. You're going to lose a debate 99% of the time if you try to say that church history is on your side if you're a cessationist, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So one question that cessationists raise, which I think we should address, is does this mean the canon is not closed? They'll say that if you say God said this, now that is as authoritative and binding as Scripture, and you are claiming to have the authority of the Bible. Do you think that's a fair critique? What, what, what would you say in response to that as a continuationist? I don't think so. I think it's pretty clear in Scripture that it's not on the same level as Scripture, right? We believe that, at least as Protestants, I think if you're a Catholic or an Orthodox, you have a different argument for what makes up Scripture, right? But as Protestants, we would say, the people that get to write Scripture are the people who were with Jesus, who had were eyewitnesses of him um, and walked and talked with him, all that kind of stuff, right? Those are the people that get to write scripture. Those are the people who write our New Testament and are affirmed to have written it, all that kind of stuff. We don't have any of those people now today, so we don't get to do that. If you're an Orthodox or a Catholic person, you would say that the church is the one who has the ultimate authority. Scripture is on the same level of authority as the church, but the church is the one who gave us the Bible, who put that together, and that's why we have it. It's just stories, testimonies about what has happened, right? So uh, a little bit different reasons mm -hmm. there, but I don't think that that would be a good argument to make necessarily. I'm not claiming that my like revelations that I get from God are scripture, but I think that they're true, right? I think they're from God, so they're still important. They're very important to me. Like if I believe God's telling me something, I think that that's important, right? And I should follow those things. Yeah, and there are things where for myself, if I feel like God is telling me something specifically, I will try to discern if that's binding or not. Like I, like God told me when I was 19 to stop listening to Kendrick Lamar. I have not listened to a Kendrick Lamar song in nine years. Intentionally. Intentionally. Now, if people around me have played his music, I don't force them to come to my convictions. I'll just let them play it. And if he's been featured on songs that I've listened to, then I'm like, okay, like he's just featured. And I felt like the peace of the Lord was like, yeah, that seems acceptable. But I have not listened to anything he's produced. And I've heard snippets, like in shorts. Like this most recent album had a couple like viral sounds that went on like YouTube, YouTube shorts and stuff like that. And I thought, man, that sounds really cool. I'm not going to listen. And so that's something where I would say that command might be binding on my life, and I probably will treat it as such because I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. um, but I will not tell people that they have to succumb to this. Or if I'm giving a word to someone, you know, you submit it to the individual, and the individual discerns with the Lord how to receive it. And so I don't think it's binding as Scripture, but it might be binding to some degree. You know, if God tells someone to go to the Middle East and do missions, and they don't, and, and that is going to be problematic for them. They're going to have to um, figure out why they feel like they can disobey God 
And if they're going to say, well, mm. uh, it's just not in the scripture that I have to go. It's like, yeah, of course the scripture aren't going to tell you by name to go to a country that didn't exist in that day. You know, so there's mm-hmm. ways we have to discern that stuff. But yeah, just some so one question that stuck I out I wanted to address. it's a pretty bad argument. It's a pretty bad argument to say because something can be misused that we shouldn't use it at all, right? Like that just, I don't think that's a very good argument whatsoever because what like I can't operate in the gifts that God has for me if I, if he truly has them. Like if you admit that, yeah, the Bible teaches based on everything that we've talked about today that the gifts are still continuing and you're a cessationist, you would say, well, that seems dangerous to me. I don't think we should use them because someone could misuse it and as people have done, start cults right? Like Mormons and uh, Muslims, stuff like that, right? By claiming they have new revelation. Look, I'm not going to like tell you that Muslims and Mormons are good. I think you can point to a lot of places of scripture that say, hey, you're incorrect in what you believe. And you can use that to defeat them very easily, right? They're deceived by another spirit. That's clearly outlined in scripture that that's bad. But what is even worse than that is to say, well, God has given us this gift because like someone could misuse it. I'm just going to ignore it altogether and not see healing, and not see the kingdom come here in all the ways that are described in the New Testament, because it could be misused. I think that's ridiculous. Like, you're not going to par- follow a giant portion of the New Testament because you're afraid of what someone could do to misuse it. I just don't see how that's a good use of Scripture. You know what I mean? Yeah, and to the point about, like, oh, people start cults. Yeah, that's why Paul says, test the spirits. That Like... Mm-hmm. There, there's reasons for why we're told to test them because they can be misused. If they couldn't be misused, you wouldn't have to test them. But because every book in the New Testament, except for maybe one, warns against false prophets and the gifts are still happening, we're told to test them. We know that people are going to be seeking opportunity to take advantage of God's people and we have to be on the lookout for that. But to say I'm not going to believe in the gifts because they can be misused or I'm not going to practice the gifts because they've been misused is no different than saying I'm not going to go to church because church hurt happens. It, it's as illogical mm-hmm. as that. Now, I think if you, you could say I don't understand all this and so I'm cautious to use them, but I'm open, that's a good starting place. I, I hope you progress from there. That's yeah. a good place to be where it's like, hey, if this is real, I want to believe it and I don't know how to, I, I don't know how to refute it right now. And I'm open for the Lord to, to teach me. That's a good place. That's a, that's a great place to be. Yeah. All right. Let's go to our last argument really fast before we get into some other, some other stuff um, about our experiences. Mm-hmm. And this is a the last argument because I think it holds the least amount of weight. But still, it is very important, right? If the Christian church is seeing miracles happen today, is hearing from the Lord, and it seems to be in line with Scripture— Um, then how can that be seen as a bad thing? Where are those revelations coming from? Um, Where is that healing coming from? If it's from demons, why are demons, if God truly, if Christ truly won the keys of death uh, from Hades by dying on the cross, right? If he truly has those and he is the king of this world now and he's ruling and reigning, if he truly is doing that and the, the enemy has been defeated, then why is the enemy the one who has all the power on this earth and... Jesus doesn't have any, or he's taking it from us because we don't need it anymore. And that's confusing to me. Ethan, is there anything you want to say on that topic or any personal experiences you want to share with people about how you've experienced the gifts? I've had tons of experiences with the gifts. Um, one of the weirdest was someone, I had some back pain. I used to be a welder. And so I was, I pulled my back or something. And this man looked at me and we were having like a prayer night at our church. And he's like, you're healed in Jesus name. And I was like, what he's like you're healed and he just he didn't pray he just looked at me and said i was healed in jesus name and i was like what and he's like yeah pick me up and i picked him up and there was like no pain one of the most uh profound wow. ones was i had <laughs> yeah, pick me up yeah it was i was he's a pretty big guy too he's like six five i was like all right um you hurt your back again yeah i'm like ah, pray again <laughs> <laughs> oh no it was, it was good i was healed and then the most extreme uh, healing I've seen that comes to mind is I had a torn labrum in my shoulder and I couldn't raise my hand higher than this, which for you guys on camera is like shoulder length or on audio is shoulder length. And I was at a prayer night or a worship service and they're like, Hey, I feel like God wants to move and he wants to heal people. If you need 
prayer for healing raise your hand so obviously i raised my other hand because i couldn't raise my injured hand um and I, I just told him hey this is what happened i hurt myself working out i can't raise it and i didn't know it was torn i just knew i couldn't move it very high i just thought it was like a sprain mm-hmm. like a strained muscle and i didn't know the extent of the damage and they prayed and within a few seconds i had full mobility back it was amazing and it was great now a couple months later did i tear my labrum again by lifting too much because i was an ego lifter yes did the holy spirit heal that one miraculously <laughs> no and i felt like god told me ethan i gave you a miraculous healing once you messed up now you have to get surgery and you can have fun with your family for <laughs> three more months and i will defend that till i die because people were praying that it would get healed and i was like guys i i understand i messed up i was not stewarding my healing well and and God's like, you didn't learn your lesson, sucker. Uh, just say that That's a little awesome. bit facetiously. But yeah, I've had times where yeah. I've had dreams that I tell people things and um, primarily about like um, what to do after their ministry school and coming on staff. And then I tell them like, hey, I had this weird dream. This is what happened. And I feel like God told me if you want to come on staff, it's a good idea. And this person's like, I've been praying for weeks mm. on what to do. And this really gives some clarity. And they, be, they came on staff. So, you know, there, there's... Mm ways i've seen the lord move in so many powerful ways like tons and tons and tons like Darren and i've experienced it together when on mission trips like visions and and pictures while praying and looking it up the picture we got to find out it's a real thing in reality we're like we had no idea we've never been to this country what the heck mm-hmm. um so just yeah endless it's not endless but like a ton of stories that still continue yeah and so yeah. no one could ever tell me that the the gifts stopped because I've experienced them in settings that glorify God to to yeah. a degree where I can't ever deny it. Yeah, really crazy stuff. For me, I'll just share uh, two instances really fast uh, of words I feel like I've gotten for other people that have been true. Every word, I, I'm not kidding about this. I don't get words of knowledge a lot, like four people but every single time i have gotten one it's been absolutely right i think it's happened to me three or four times in my life um, it's because you're dyslexic two. so one and god knows you won't be able to read them <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> uh, one when i was pretty young i think i was like 16 or 17 i was in church i was worshiping i felt really sad all of a sudden and usually i'm really joyful in church and um i was like wow like why do i feel sad and bummed out all of a sudden and i prayed and the lord said i gave you that feeling because that's how someone in the audience feels right now and i was like oh weird and i felt like the lord said that person is depressed and like wants to kill themselves and i need you to go talk to them and i was like i can't do that because i can't just ask someone if they want to kill themselves like that's very weird and i don't know who they are and so i was like okay lord like show me who they are if that's what you want me to do and i waited a couple minutes and this dude walks past me out of uh the worship service and there's still a few songs left and i felt like the lord said that's the guy and i was like whoa like that's weird i have to follow him i guess and so I walk out of church and into the foyer and there's nobody there but me and him, which is a surprise because, you know, a few hundred people go to this church. So there should be people out there. Um, but everybody is doing a good job worshiping in the sanctuary. <laughs> and so he he just stops in the middle of the foyer and just stands there. And so I exit the uh, the doors and I see him I'm like, OK, I'm going to talk to him. And so I just walked up and I was like, hey, bro, my name's is Derry. How you doing? And he's like, hey, like, this is my name. Uh, and I was like, how you doing today? And he's like, I honestly am doing really bad. Like I'm having kind of like a a breakdown right now. And we keep talking. And eventually he tells me that he's been thinking about killing himself and that he like really just needs hope. And we got to pray and encourage him. Um, And we were friends for quite a while after that. I don't know him anymore, but we were friends for probably five or six years until I moved away. That's one instance. The second one was two years ago, I believe. I was in church and I was worshiping and I heard the Lord say, the guy next to you. And I was like, well, what? And I look over, the guy next to me, and he was like, that guy, I need you to pray for him. I was like, okay, uh, what do you want me to pray for him for or say? And he was like, uh, he was like, there needs to be uh, healing between him and his parents, and I want there to be joy in that relationship. I was like, all right, well, if he has a great relationship with his parents, I'm screwed, but I'm going to ask him anyway. <laughs> and so I walk over to him uh, during prayer, and I was like, hey, uh, I was wondering if I could pray for you. I feel like the Lord said something to you, to me about you. And he was like, okay. And I was like, do you have a good relationship with your parents possibly? And he goes, you know what? Like I was adopted like at a young age 
And it hasn't been until the last like couple months that I've been trying to get re in, in re like in contact with my parents again. And I just found them and I've been really like nervous about reaching out and like making contact again because there's still like a lot of like feelings there um, between reconciliation. Wow. And I got to pray for him and, uh, and he reconnected with them and everything and it was cool. But like those things, I, there's no way for me to know those things, right? And I, I don't go up to random people and pray for them in church unless the Lord tells me to usually, unless it's like an encouraging thing or I know they're going through something. You know what I mean? And so like there's no way for me to know those very specific details. Someone wants to kill themselves and that uh, like someone is struggling with their parents. Like both of these people just seemed like normal people, not a ton of facial expressions. It's not like the guy that was depressed was crying. And I even got that word before I ever saw him, like five minutes before I saw him. Mm -hmm. And so mm – -hmm. If these gifts are still continuing, if Christians are seeing miraculous things happen, I don't know as a cessationist what you say that is. Because you want to be really, really careful that you're not committing the unforgivable sin, right? The unforgivable sin is knowing that something is from the Lord and saying that it's demonic, right? And the only option for Christians that are charismatics that are doing these gifts, the only place that they're getting power, if it's not from God, is from the enemy. There's only two camps that have power. You know what I mean? And so if you're a cessationist and you're saying, well, that power is not from God, that's from a demon, I'd watch out. You better I be sure. I would be very wary about saying that. You, you better, better be, be really sure. sure now, I don't think that. you, if you have done that, so if you're a cessationist watching and you have done that, I don't, I don't think you should be terrified. Like, have I committed the unforgivable sin? Am I going to hell? I think the unforgivable sin is committed knowingly. And so you, I don't think you can get sure. in arrogance commit that. So just rest assured. But you're getting close though. <laughs> But if you're feeling some heat on your back, in the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a conviction of the Lord. It's not hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, there's there's tons of experiences that we've both had, and one of them too, like in prayer one time, I was I was praying for a friend, and I felt like I got this picture of a wedge in in, a, in their family, just something that was I didn't I didn't know what it was, just it was literally a picture of an upside down triangle, and I, was, I felt like the Lord was like, there's a wedge in their family, something's happening. So I just texted them. I was like, hey, I was praying for you randomly. I just, in my prayer time, felt led to pray for you. This is the picture I got. Is there something going on? And it was like accurate. They're like, yeah, this thing is like really driving my family apart. And I was like, well, let's pray about that. You know, we've had, I've had different friends. I think Derry's had some friends where we've had, uh, they, they've had demons cast out of them. And so deliverance still happens. Mm. One of our friend's dads, he did, he didn't believe in deliverance. He actually came on the podcast, Rod Bladelaw. So check out his episode. He didn't, he yeah. didn't believe in deliverance and then read the Bible and it said, those who believe in me will cast out demons. So he was like, all right, God, like if you want to <laughs> show us how to do this. And for 10 years, every week, every week for 10 years, someone was manifesting in their living room and they were delivering them. So I don't know what you do with that. What do you do with that? You know, now a reason I, I think know. people who are cessationists will say they don't believe that gifts happen is because they don't see them. And I think that is a, is not the best argument to make because that is very conditional on your experience and not yeah. something that's objective. And the reason you might not be seeing miracles or speak in tongues or get words of knowledge or prophecy might be because you're not knocking. You know, knocking it will be yeah. open to you. Asking you will receive. And so if you're not doing the work, God's like, why would it, why would God give you a word of knowledge for someone if he knows you're going to dismiss it as your imagination and not do anything with it? It doesn't make sense. You know, God's got people like us who are continuationists who will do his will. So he's like, look, I'll use them for other things. I'm not saying like God's not using you. I'm sure he is in different ways. He's not limited to your theological positions. But he it just doesn't make sense why he would I mean, he could to really break break out of your theological box for sure, but it seems like God would just choose someone who believes in these things already to do the things rather than someone who's going to just dismiss it. Hmm. Super good. So I think that's kind of the conclusion of our case for why we believe in continuationism. I think that we, our side has so honestly, so much more evidence than the cessationist side if you're a cessationist listening we'd love to have you on and do a debate or a conversation if you're interested um, but at this point in the show we kind of want to shift a little bit to some possible dangers of cessationism and these are these are honest things usually when it comes to theological differences i'm pretty wary of saying that a certain ideology is dangerous but i genuinely think that 
if you're a cessationist, you got to be really, really, really sure from scripture that that's true because otherwise you're denying a really, really large part of what the Bible commands Christians to do, right? Like you have to ignore scripture, like Mm. in what we're commanded to do, if that's the position you're going to take. And so we wanted to go through this Instagram post that we saw the other day on cessationism and just talk about if we agree with the different aspects of it. It's a couple different memes. They're not really super funny, but they're uh, enlightening. So I don't know, Ethan, if you want to pull that up or not. Yeah, yeah we're up Maybe there. Maybe you can read it too, because I can't see it. Yeah, so the first one is says, it's a, it's a classic meme for those in the audio. You're missing out on our funny memes that we did not create. We just took from Instagram. It's the classic meme with uh, Michael Scott shaking hands with his boss. And so it says, cessationist theology and atheist. And the handshake is, no one hears from God. Which is... Hmm. We we know some of these are kind of facetious. They're just funny, you know. Um, we don't we, mm. we all love all love to those as brothers and sisters, but it's funny to say that they don't. Yeah. Hear, no one hears from God because that's what they would say. When the Bible says that we are not to be conformed to the patterns of this world, I think that this is a very interesting aspect that a cessationist could disagree with me on, but I think is really telling. Atheism almost by definition, comes from the Enlightenment, right? That was when we separated our need for God and morality, and we, through a lot of different uh, philosophers, decided, hey, we have science now. We don't believe God exists. We don't believe that any kind of spiritual things exist or anything outside of this world. When we die, we just go to the grave, and thus naturalism was born, right? Or at least an atheistic type of naturalism. What a and boring so, worldview. Yeah, it's crazy. You don't have cessationism in actuality until the Enlightenment, just when you have atheism coming about. So they start to exist pretty much at the same time, and the worldviews are like mirror images of each other. There's basically no spiritual things that happen. Go ahead, Ethan. I was going to say, it's a pretty materialistic way to look at the world as a Christian, to say nothing, no, yeah. no spiritual experiences happen other than conversion. And I when I and the, and it just seems sad because it's like man like there's a whole world and experience in the Christian life and fruit of the spirit and power of God that you're missing out on, and it just is it's I think mm. cessationism it, it kind of feels like Christian materialism, all that exists is the natural expression, yeah. supernatural is not real. I know they would say it's real and they they would say the Holy Spirit can quicken things mm. to your imagination while reading scripture. Um, but yeah, just I'm like, come on, guys, come on. Hmm. Do you want to yeah. go to the next one? Not, of course, not every cessationist I think is in line with this, but the ideology I believe is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go to the mm-hmm. next one. So now it says cessationist theology and the Enlightenment spiritual experiences should be distrusted. So great segue into what you were just you talking go. about. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty straightforward. It's a it's a distrust, which is the. If you've ever talked to a cessationist, that is their mindset and worldview most of the time. Mm-hmm. I think some cessationists would say, yeah, there are some miracles that can happen when God wants to do them, but it's not up to humans. It's not a thing God partners with humans to do. It's when he wants to do them. And so there is a basic mis- distrust of anything spiritual that happens, any experience, uh, any uh, healing, anything like that, any gift that people claim any prophecy, anything like that, it's an automatic, I don't think that happened. It has, I have to have a lot of evidence to say that it did. Mm-hmm. I think I would agree Same thing that... Same would say. Yeah, I would agree that spiritual experiences only happen when God wants them to. I would just also say I think God wants them to a lot. So, I think God often For wants sure. them. So, anyways, going on to the next one. Cessationist theology and Muslims. God has spoken and doesn't speak anymore. That's a, I would also say Jews. You could add Jews in there. Um, I don't maybe, but sure. But yeah, you know they they don't believe that, that any supernatural modern day expression of the Holy Spirit. We talked about it a lot the whole mm-hmm. episode. All right, going to the next one. Unless you have something to say for this one. Why? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know why a cessationist would think that God doesn't speak anymore. Like it makes sense that some you'd think some gifts end. Like if you just don't see them in your life, but. God has been speaking from before the time of Abraham to like the apostles and then there's ends for some reason. Like why I think is that? This, like, are we not does he not love his people anymore? Well, I think this might be a mischaracterization because mm-hmm. 
there, I, when I talk to my cessationist friends, I ask them like, Hey, when you're reading the Bible, do you have times where a verse jumps off the page at you and they thought that you did not originate comes to your mind that teaches you how to follow God more accurately? And they're like, Oh yeah, that happens all the time. And I was like, that's the voice of God. I was like, that's what I call hearing from God. And they call it the quickening of the spirit or sanctification, but I call it the voice of God. So I think we have the same experiences. They're just not acknowledging that it's the voice of God or they don't want to claim it's the voice of God because it maybe makes them feel uncomfortable. So this one might be a mischaracterization to some degree, at least in my experience of who I've talked to. I don't think it is because <laughs> I don't think they would call that. I don't think they would call that the voice of God. They say it's the quickening of the spirit and it's from the power of scripture, not from God speaking to you. Like we see in, but in the, scripture, the thought right? in that scripture, originated God outside of them is the voice, voice of and God he speaks to people. Every uh, cessationist I've talked to has said that's not the voice of God. That's They're just God wrong. highlighting something to you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what? He's highlighting it. He's showing you. He's leading you. He's teaching you. It's him speaking. Just because it's not audible. But don't be such a stickler for what defines voice. The leading of the Lord. <laughs> Just be happy God's leading you and, 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 and is present and mm. moving. The moving of the Spirit. You want to say that? Fine. It's the voice of God. You don't want it. You don't have to use those words, yeah. but it is. All right. <laughs> but they would believe that God wouldn't speak in any kind of words to an individual outside of scripture. Like God's not giving words of knowledge, prophecy, speaking to an individual, telling them to repent or telling them to go this way or that way or pray for this person or that person. It's only through scripture. Yeah. But if they, in my mind, if they're, if a cessationist is walking and just feels like, I feel like I should pray for that stranger, just an encouragement. I'm like, that's God leading you. And so you could say that's God speaking. Mm -hmm. I just think God speaking is just way more simple than they understand. They think it is, but they don't. I know they don't think it is. It doesn't mean they're right. Like they can, they're just wrong mm -hmm. in how they're understanding. It. At least in my opinion. I'm like, you guys are just wrong. Anyways, moving on. Right, so we got <laughs> how we have Satan and cessationist <laughs> theology, which says desiring or despising prophecy. Dang. That one is just Not a said. troll. I think that's just a troll. It's a little true. Yeah, it's a little true, but it's a little troll that they know what they're doing with that one. That they know what they're doing with that one. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Thomas Jefferson and cessationist naturalism masquerading as a viable, viable theological view. That's kind of what we talked about earlier with the materialism. You know, it's just like whatever. Yeah, that's funny. And these are all if just. If you don't know laughs. anything about the early, the early American fathers, they were pretty much all deists. So they didn't believe God had anything to do with this world. He created it. They left it alone. What a boring belief. Cessationist theology, yeah. practicing witches, both agree that dreams and visions are inherently demonic. I didn't know practicing witches did believe that. I would think they would be like, dreams were good. But we've only ever had one witch well, yeah, on the show. Well, yeah, but they come from demons. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're good. They come from demons. They're on the demon side. Yeah, that's true. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. All right. Uh, next one. Cessationists and Unitarians being known for what you don't believe. Okay, so that's pretty, yeah. Dang. That's <laughs> solid. Being known for what you don't believe. Unitarians don't that's believe awesome. in the Trinity. Cessationists don't believe in Continuationists. All right. Oof. Next one. Cessationist theology and LGBTQ theology. First Corinthians can't be oh. taken literally. <laughs> <laughs> that was so that one's the my favorite one that one's hilarious dude that oh man i yeah. love that it's so funny <laughs> holy you God. have to have such a different hermeneutic for both of those theologies to get what you want out of them right like if you're gonna read first corinthians as a whole and say gifts don't exist after you read it like you gotta have a real interesting hermeneutic to get that you know what i mean mm -hmm. if anyone's ever read first corinthians or second corinthians you gotta you gotta ignore some real key verses to say that like what's said there isn't literal. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, that's the end of the memes. Just some fun goofs at the end of the episode. Mm. Yeah, with the to cap that off, do you think that uh, these things are true at all in the dangers of cessationism, or do you think it's not that big of a deal? 
Oh, I think cessationism is pretty dangerous. You're missing out on a ton of, mm-hmm. well, one fun part of Christianity, the active moving of God through the spirit to impact people's lives instantaneously through healings and prophecies and words of knowledge. That's profound. And if you're missing out, what a bummer. Um, also, it's yeah. dangerous because if you're teaching people God doesn't do this and now they're missing out because of your theological view, that's bad for the people you're discipling. And I think... I wonder like if God's upset about it sometimes because like, yes, God loves them and God longs for them to come to heaven. But I wonder if God's sometimes mad at them. Like you are, you are mischaracterizing me and how I'm acting. And, and he probably doesn't like that. And it's hurting Mm -hmm. people. It's keeping people in bondage. Quite literally people might have demons Mm -hmm. and be cessationists and not be able to get free from the demons because they don't believe God wants to free them from their demons. Or God doesn't free them from yeah. demons now. So it's like you're quite literally holding people in captivity that God wants them to walk in freedom. Uh, so, yeah, I think mm-hmm. it's dangerous. I don't want to be mean to the people. So, I, you know, if people are cessationists, I, 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 like I said, nothing but love. I just think you want to question this view. Love the cessationist, not the theology. Just like we love the <laughs> sinner, not the sin. <laughs> That's crazy. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the theology all right. at all, but I love the people who believe it. So, you know. There you go. All right. I would agree. I think that it's very problematic. And please, if you're a cessationist, we'd love to have you on, discuss. Please stop um, being cessationist you if think. you are. Now, I know a few cessationists that are basically just continuationists, light, where it's like, I'll ask them, do you think that, and this is not at all a good representation of cessationism. This is just some people that I am friends with. I'll ask them, do you think that you could pray for healing and it could happen? And they'll be like, yeah. And like, do you believe you could prophesy or you could speak in tongues and it could happen? And they're like, yeah. And like, so the gifts still happen? And they're like, no. And like, but you're doing well, all of them. The reason they and say like, that yeah. is because they believe that like healing. No, I know why. What, well, the reason is they believe that what they believe about continuationists, which is not true of all of us, they believe continuationists think that we can do these things on command. Like I can on command mm. heal you when I want, like X-Men, which I would not, I would say is wrong. Now, mm. you might be able to say, you might be able to say you on command can prophesy over people because the Bible says God's thoughts for us outnumber the grains of sand on the sea. So you could just generally pick something that's true about how God feels about them by knowing the character of God. And I wonder if that could be considered prophecy. You know, if God has billions of good thoughts towards us and you just pick one to encourage someone with, how is that not prophecy? You're relaying to some them to you're relaying something to them that's true about what God feels towards them. You know? Maybe. Yeah, possibly. You could also just quote scripture. Yeah. And yeah. Then Maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but I'm like, guys, this can't be that hard. Come on. So those kind of cessationists, I think it's, there's really no difference between us and them except for uh, in word because for them, they're saying, hey, the gifts didn't continue. God can just choose to do this whenever he wants through people and he quickens people to do it at times and so they do it. And in my mind, I'm like, they didn't continue, but they still happen. Yeah. Like, interesting. That's not what cessationists actually believe. But if that's what you're saying, you're basically just a continuationist because the <laughs> gifts are still continuing. You're like, like, I don't know. I don't know if you know what the word cessationist means. Yeah. But there, the root word is cease. I think there is a pretty big faction of cessationists that do believe that. They still believe that most of the gifts can happen today. It's just not a gift for a person, it's just a thing that God can do if he wants to through people. I would agree. And I would say he wants to a lot. And I don't and like healing. I don't think healing's a gift for a person. It says those who believe will heal. So it's a gift for every believer. Mm-hmm. You know? Same with prophecy. Now there I think it's a gift for a person and a gift for everybody. Yeah. But, now yeah. prophecy and speaking in tongues and some of that stuff you could say is like that's that's for specific individuals. I don't think all of us are entitled to all the gifts. Mm-hmm. I used to believe that. And then I read Corinthians and Paul quite clearly says <laughs> some are a toe and some are a hand. So there we go. I think uh, those are my main thoughts about that. 
and uh, hope you guys enjoyed. Yeah. See you next week. Bye.